believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 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 God is good. Amen. Amen. Man, such a wonderful day. Guys, before um, we honor the Lord and just respect that he's given us the living word, um, I have a couple of announcements. We actually have men's breakfast the 22nd. Pastor Joseph really encourages all you guys to be there. It's great. You get to know a lot more guys from Canyon Hills. It's at the main campus. And if you'd like to buy a ticket and more info, it will be downstairs. And I believe that's it. Only announcement, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got it, man. I know. I was just testing you, man. Next week, we're starting this series of sex, love, and marriage. We really encourage everyone to come just see the beauty that God has behind all these things. We know that the world has turned all these things around and just made these things look evil. They've, per they've perverted it. But we know that sex is beautiful in the eyes of God and marriage. Love is beautiful, of course, because God is love. And marriage is just a union. It's, it's the holy union that we see that we have with God when we come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, guys, can I have all you guys stand up really quickly? We're just going to honor the word of God. So um, I had this verse set up. I was about to give you guys some fire. I was about to drop all these verses. But the Lord really put on my heart, and he said, Isa, in America, you guys have it good. Like, we can literally just come to church. We can thank God for, for worship, thank God for family. But sometimes we neglect the word of God. Uh, we see in other, in other nations, we see all around the world that people are dying just to have pages of the Bible. People are dying just to meet with their family, with the believers, just to say the name of Jesus. People are being, they're being, literally, their heads are being cut off. They're being shot in the face, all these stuff. Like, we have to realize we're not, we're not the only Christians in the world. Like, there's, our brothers and sisters across the world are dying just to read a page of the Bible, just to see what God thinks of them, just to hear God's voice again. Because sometimes God doesn't speak to you audibly or through your heart. Sometimes he's just like, open the Bible, son. Open the Bible, daughter. Everything you need is in there. So God really wanted me to just tell you guys that, and we have it so good, guys. Literally, the Bible says that God literally lifts the word of God above his own name. If he lifts up the word of God above his own name, we should know that there's some significance to that. We should know that, God, there's something in this that you want to let me know. God, that it says in your word that those who know the truth shall be set free. Amen. Amen. So you guys, I just encourage all of us, not just here, but when we go home throughout the week, let's get in the word of God. Let's get in the word of God. Let's know, about our, let's know more about our Lord and Savior. Let's have communion with him in that way. Let us just pray. Father, I just thank you today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you've given a Pastor Joseph a word, Lord, that's going to convict 
convict us, Lord, that's going to change us, Lord. And it says in your word, those who know the Son, Jesus, those who have the Son, Jesus, are free, Lord. We thank you tonight, Lord, because of your word, we are free. We thank you, Lord, because you died on the cross and rose again, Lord, we are free. We thank you tonight, Father, that the word will just penetrate us, Lord, and it will produce much fruit, Lord, in time, in time, Father. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Get your Bibles out. Get your U versions out. Let's get in it together this evening. God bless you. I love you no matter what. Oh, man. I love you more. I like that. Well, Christ is risen. That's the good news. Amen. I'm done. Close the book. Let's go home, right? Well, yes, in a way. But let's expound upon that for a few moments together. Let's look at this. And, and I want to ask you a question to kind of to kind of start off. Have you ever felt bound up by anything? Have you? Like, I mean, be honest. You don't have to be church answer here. Have you ever felt bound by something? Have you ever tried to get victory in an area over and over and over, and yet you seem to go back to it over and over and over and over again? Yeah? I think we all have experienced that at some time. I'm convinced that every person struggles with something in their life. I'm convinced that there is a thing this evening that if you could give it to God, you would. For most of us in here. Now, for some of you, maybe you're doing really good right now. And maybe you've really fought some battles and you're experiencing incredible victory. Well, that's awesome. I need you to intercede for the vast majority of the rest of the people here tonight. Because there are a lot of people that deal with things over and over and over, and what happens is frustration. But friends, Easter is about Jesus doing the impossible. It's about him rising from the dead, an impossible task, and yet he did it. Easter is about conquering of death and coming out of a tomb. And it's not just about him conquering death and coming out of a tomb. It's about you having access to the one who conquers death and comes out of tombs. It's about you having access to all of the power and all of the victory that Christ has. And everyone said amen. amen. I want to show you an Easter passage that's interesting. And it's in Matthew 27, verse 50. It's on version, the app. If you have that on your phone, you can actually download all of my notes right now, too, if you'd like to see those. But Matthew 27, 50, if you have your Bibles, turn there right now, and I'm going to read. It says this, as Jesus was being crucified, and we're going to rewind in time just for a moment here. At Easter, we don't like to talk about the crucifixion much. And oftentimes when we have the Good Friday services, they're very somber, and they're very quiet and reverent, and I get that, and I understand that. But I'm always like, yo, I know the story. Like, we win. It's okay. Like, he's not dead. And people, sometimes those services seem so sad and solemn, and I get it. It's respect. But sometimes I'm like, guys, like, He's alive, okay? He's here. It's all good. Like, everybody calm down. He didn't just stay dead, all right? So we're going to rewind for a second, but don't get sad with me right now. You could be happy because he did this for you. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This is when he died. Then, behold, this is interesting, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now let's pause there so that I can explain to you something. If you wanted to get into God's presence in the Old Testament before Christ, what you had to do was you had to go to a priest. You had to go to somebody that would go to God on your behalf. And there was this thick separation between you and the actual presence of God. Nobody could actually go into the presence of God except the high priest. What happened when Jesus died, it says that that barrier between Everybody, that's you and that's me, it was torn from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, that any man could ever do it. And it's like this thick veil, not just some little fabric. I'm talking about nobody could tear it. It was, it was several layers thick, okay? And it was torn by God's hand to say, humanity, listen up, I have torn down the separation wall. You now have full access to me through my son, Jesus Christ. Come on. Yeah. So nobody could experience God's presence. The closest that they could get was called the Ark of the Covenant. And this was where the Holy of Holies was. It was, it was placed there inside of that, that 
room behind this thick curtain, behind an, a courtyard and an outer courtyard, and then there was, there was like layers upon layers upon layers before you could ever even become that high priest person. And, and in fact, if you weren't even born into the right family, there's no chance that you would ever even have a, have a chance to go into God's presence. Imagine that, being born and knowing you could never experience God's presence. That's crazy. Sometimes we take God's presence for granted, you know? Like, he's here right now, and you feel his presence during worship, and you feel him even now through his word being preached. And sometimes we can just be like, oh, yeah, that's God. That's his presence. And, we, you know, it's, oh, it's no big deal. It's just God. Like, it's one of our friends showing up to Upper Room. Oh, what's up, Jesse? What's up, God? How you doing? You know, it's like the same level sometimes. But they're not the same level. I would encourage you to become familiar with God's presence, but don't neglect it. Because sometimes our familiarity is like it breeds contempt for, for people and also for God's presence, you know. Let's never, ever take for granted the fact that we have access to the presence of God and that the cost was not just blood, but every drop of blood and the very breath of Christ, his very last breath. Amen? It would be like if you came to church today. And there was a big curtain drawn around the stage. And you couldn't see me or any of the band. And we're up here having a great time with the Lord. And the sound system's not on and the lights aren't on. And the best that you can hope is that we encounter God's presence and at some point come out and tell you what it was like. How would you feel about that? This is the reality for the entire world up until that point. But this is also, unfortunately, the reality for many people in the world still today, and maybe even some of you in this room tonight. Look at verse 51 through 53 says, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, and check this out. This is a trip. The graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These people who were dead were actually testifying of the power of Jesus Christ. So can you imagine that? Like have you ever had like a grandma or a grandpa? Who's had a family member that's passed away? Raise your hand. I have. Okay. So all of a sudden you're just, you know, it's, it's like Easter Sunday and you're at your Easter picnic and all of a sudden grandma rolls up like, what's up, y'all? How you doing? <laughs> grandma? Yeah, what's going on? I got to tell you the coolest thing. Anyway, Grandma, I thought you were dead. I, I was, but just listen. There's this guy. His name is Jesus. He just died, okay? Shook the ground. I came out. I, I mean, I got a revelation. I got to tell you what just happened. This actually happened all over Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Like people that were dead got up and testified. But that's a miracle. But I believe tonight some people that are dead in this room are going to get up and you're going to testify of God all around this city. And there's going to be another amazing revival that's going to happen in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. God is in the business of bringing the dead to life. Whether they be the literal dead or the spiritually dead tonight. Tonight, your spiritual death is just as much of a separation as a physical death is to those people that came out of that grave. And I'm calling you out of your grave tonight. I'm calling you to stand up and to testify. Why do you think it was after Christ's death that this spread all over the Roman Empire under threat of death and persecution and torture? It spread because not only Christ himself, but there was some people that saw grandma get up out of the grave and come to breakfast and testify. That puts some boldness inside of you. <laughs> Easter is about the same power that raised Christ from the dead that can raise you out of the grave that you are buried in. I don't know what grave has you buried tonight. I don't know what bondage you are facing tonight. I don't know. I could go around this room and I could guess, but I would, I would guess that there are people in here with addictions, people that you feel like, I might be free now, but I just feel like any moment I could just go back into addiction. I feel like there might be people here tonight that you just, 
you keep fighting with sexual sin over and over and over, and you like you know you need to live right, but the temptation comes, and you're like you fall into it, and you hate it. There's people in here you're bound up by pornography, and you beat it, and then you lose, and you beat it, and then you lose, and then you get so upset, and you get frustrated with yourself. And I'm here to tell you, don't allow frustration to creep in because frustration breeds the next thing, which is defeat. And defeat is the precursor of death. So I say frustration, get off of God's people now, and I declare you are more than conquerors, and you will overcome, and you will see victory, and you will make it. You will. You can. I believe it. And why do I believe it? Because, oh, I just have faith. No, because I'm a walking testimony. I'm one of those people that God got up out of the grave. And I'm here saying, hey, I was in the grave. I had bondage. And I got up. And I'm breathing. And I'm living. And I'm telling you, there are people that are experiencing true freedom. And you can too. Hallelujah. In fact, when you experience resurrection power, it takes on a whole new meaning in your life. A couple things. Number one, when life has you buried, I want you to, to remember that the Bible doesn't just highlight the good people and the perfect people. The Bible is filled with flawed characters, and it shows us weakness even in men of God. Even in the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of our New Testament, in Romans 7, he writes about some emotions and some feelings that he had of feeling bound and feeling defeated. And maybe you can identify with what he's expressing here. Number one, confusion. Romans 7. I don't really understand myself. And when I see, I see Paul writing, really one of his master letters here in Romans. It's a, it's a beautiful letter. And, and I, I get this picture of him writing almost, almost very intimately. And he says, I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do is what's right. But I don't do it. And I wonder if he paused. Instead, comma. And thinking of his role in the church as a leader, as an apostle, as a church planter, as one that others are looking to, to even create and judge their own doctrine by, I wonder if he had any tension in these next words as he wrote, I do what I hate. I wonder if Apostle Paul wondered if there would be any blowback from the other elders of the church or the other leaders. I wonder if they're going to respect me. I wonder if they're going to think of me like they should. I wonder what they're going to think. And over the years, there's been lots of people implying their own opinions about what it was that the Apostle Paul was struggling with. But he doesn't say that, and so I'm not going to imply, nor am I going to try to take out what he was dealing with. But we can see clearly he was dealing with something, and yet God used him in a fantastically amazing, mighty way. God is a resurrection God. He is a restoring God. And I'm here to tell you, some of you have disqualified yourself because of your struggles, because of things that you feel bound by, because, yes, you've gotten out of the grave, but it seems like you still slip in it every once in a while. I'm, so, I'm telling you tonight to come away from those old ways and those old habits, and through the process of, of sanctification, God will conform you into his image and make you to look like his son. And I'm telling you, it's a process. And the number one tool in your tool belt to realize that is for you to understand how much Jesus loves you. You're not filth. You're not an addict. You're not an alcoholic. You're not addicted to anything. Quit saying that. Quit confessing that. You don't, quit saying, oh, I just have an anger issue. Quit saying, oh, I just can't keep a relationship. Quit saying that because it's not true. You're talking about the one that's in the grave. No wonder you keep falling back into it. You're standing over it, staring down at it, talking about it. Get away from it and start confessing who you are now in Christ. You are free. You are pure. You are righteous. You are the righteousness of Christ. Wow. Come on. This is good word tonight. Verse 18, and I know that nothing good lies, lives in me, comma, that is 
in my sinful nature. That's the old me. That's the death. I want to do what is right, but I can't. This is the Apostle Paul going back to the grave for a moment and looking down on his old bones. I love, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for showing us the humanity of your leaders. That's something that really sets the Bible apart from every other religious book in all of creation. God doesn't use superheroes like Superman. God uses superheroes like Jesse and Eric and Christoph and Fred and Isa. People that are just men and women, people with flaws and mistakes. Number two, number two, maybe you've dealt with that confusion. Confusion gives birth to frustration, as I mentioned a moment ago. Not only am I confused, but I'm angry with the way things are in my life. This is where people start to feel hopeless. This is where they decide to give up. And this is where they say, I guess this is how it's going to be. This will be my secret struggle. This will be my thorn in the side. This will be my cross to bear. And I have to tell you tonight, put that mentality away. Don't let frustration creep in. Don't give up. Romans 7, 21, it says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Confusion, now frustration, which ultimately gives way to discouragement. And this is the most dangerous place to be because it's where people lose their courage and they stop trying. Romans 7, 24, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Now, Paul is talking about the tension between his spirit and his flesh. He is, this, this, this passage has been taken apart from a few different angles, and there's some argument about it. Is Paul talking about his personal struggle, or is he giving an analogy for the church at large? I've heard both arguments. I truly believe this is the Apostle Paul bearing open his heart for us to see and saying, hey, look, I'm your leader, but I'm like you, Okay? How frustrating is it for the church to set up some false pretenses of perfection for people? Quit focusing on that. Start focusing on Jesus. And here's the big secret. When you focus on Jesus, you actually get to where you wanted to go in the first place. It's amazing. But so many churches and so many Christians preach sin, 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 sin. Focus, focus, focus. Be better, be better, be better. Okay, that doesn't work, but Jesus does. The more you understand who you are in Christ and how much you are loved, the better you will find all of that stuff works out. You are not trash. You're not garbage. You're not filth. Christ paid the highest price for you. And if I was to go out to the parking lot right now, and maybe I had for sale this old, beat-up, 1981 Chevy Citation. It's brown, and it's falling apart. And that was my first car, by the way. I described it perfectly right now. 81 Chevy Citation. Polyester seats, brown hubcaps on it. It was brown on brown on brown on brown, okay? I purchased that car for $1,500 when I, when I was back in high school, my first car, okay? Imagine if I still had it now. And it, 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 it's not worth... Ten bucks. And we go out there, and I say, hey, I want to sell you this car. Oh, really? Yeah, I want to give you this car for $30,000. You guys are laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Tell me why you're laughing. It's ridiculous. Why? Because the car has no value. You don't pay a high price for trash. Every single one of you would look at me and say, that's, that's garbage. Does it even run? I don't know. It's a classic. I'm trying to sell you on it. This is an 81 citation, my friend. Cla no, you would be like, get out of here. Okay, let's flip the script. Say we go to the parking lot now, okay? And we have out there a brand new top-of-the-line car. Say, for example, right now, like a car that's really hot. I don't, I don't want to say it because you all would get, like, mad because you all have your opinions of what's the greatest thing. But in your mind, the greatest car, like, 100, 200, 300,000, like, Lamborghini or, like, one of those, what's it called? 
Elon Musk cars, the electric ones, the Tesla, right, whatever it is. I don't know, but they're like 100,000, 200,000 plus. And now I go out and I say, hey, I want to sell you this car. And I say, I want to give you a really good deal on it. And I say, it'll only be $5,000. How many guys would be beg, borrowing, and stealing from every person that you could to come up with five grand right now? Why? Because it's an incredible value, right? You're like, Mom, just give me a loan, please. This is a great deal. We're going to sell it. We'll make ten times the money. It makes sense. It makes sense because why? Because it has value. This is the problem. You see yourself as that old beat-up junker and not the brand-new Lamborghini. God didn't pay a price for a piece of junk. He would never, never have died for junk. He paid a price for something better than any car, house, mansion, boat, yacht, airplane. You are God's ultimate masterpiece. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he planned for you. Listen, he planned before the very foundations of the earth. So whatever matter and physical object that you could carry of value, a hunk of gold, a new car, a yacht, a boat, a house, I don't know, an entire country is not even on the same scale. It doesn't even register on the same value scale. When God looks through creation in Ephesians 2 and says, you are my ultimate creation because I planned your good works before I even thought up matter and time and space. That's you. You need to understand who you are. Romans 7.25. But thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, he doesn't conclude with a sad note here. He says, thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus. There, if you're searching for truth inside of yourself, what you're going to find is a void. You are not the ultimate answer to the universe, but Christ in you is. If you look inside of yourself, what you will find is just emptiness and more confusion. This is the new age philosophy that the the answers are within you. And some transcendental meditation or you are God or everything is God and this carpet's God and I'm God and so are you. It's baloney. There is one way, there's one truth, and there's one life. One man, Jesus Christ, came and said, I am the only way. I am the only truth and I am the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't give any other alternate paths. He didn't say if you're a good person. He didn't say if you really, you know, you trust, you know, and you, you follow Buddhism or Hinduism. He didn't say if you follow Muhammad. He said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. And sorry, nobody comes to the Father except through me. But here's the good news. If you simply believe that I died for you, then you can have access to me. This is, a, this is a ripped open veil. All you have to do is come on in. There is nobody excluded from this party. He's saying, how much do I love you? He stretched out his arms on the cross and said this much. It said, who can come to God? What's the limit? He stretched out his arms and he died on the cross. There is no limit. There is no limit to God's grace. He'll receive you tonight if it's your hundredth time. This night can be a turning point in your life. It can be the point when you say, I was buried, I was bound, I was trapped. But on that Easter, I gave everything to God. Some of you Christians in here tonight, you've been following God, but even now your heart is stirring like, man, I have courage. I can make a change. I can do it. I can, I can be better. And you can. You can. Friends, I'm not up here just preaching some fairy tale. I'm preaching from a man that says, I was in the grave. Hatred and bitterness and envy and questions. And God raised me up out of the grave, friends. As I close tonight, I got to tell you, my grave was just filled with bitterness. My story starts in Bakersfield. As a little foster kid, my mother was a drug addict. Nobody knows who my father was. She was addicted to drugs. And I came into the world through one of her many interactions with people just trying to get another fix. Call that prostitution. So nobody really knows who my dad is. But by the grace of God, three times she tried to drive to go to abort me. 
And my aunt will tell you this story. It's an incredible story. Her tire would blow out. One time my aunt intercepted her. One time her car just quit. God was like, no, this baby's coming into the world whether you like it or not. And so here I came screaming onto the scene in, in 1983 in Bakersfield. And my mom, who was just a teenager at the time, trying to take care of me, my first memories are on Union Avenue and crack hotels and even the, very, the Tower Hotel right here. I remember playing in that parking lot when I was about five years old. I remember these memories. This was my beginning. Violence, addiction, hatred, questions. It was just me and I had an older sister and it was just chaos. But by God's grace, she left me a couple of times. The police took me in. I became a foster care. Uh, I went into the foster system, that is. And by God's grace, there was this family that adopted me. They took me in. And they raised me as their own son, which is amazing. But, you know, I, I had this great opportunity to put the death behind me and to step into the new life. But you know what happens a lot of times with foster kids? And this is an epidemic. And I believe the church needs to be the answer to this, by the way. And with many kids that are adopted, is they never fully let go of the death and the orphan mentality and step into the new sonship that they've been adopted into. And so the statistics for foster kids and people that have been adopted are just horrible. Am I right, Fred? Fred works in, in the juvenile hall as a psychiatrist, and he can verify these stats. It is, it is unspeakably horrific. And I will tell you this. I am a absolute statistical anomaly and a miracle that I'm standing here preaching the gospel. But God loves to use anomalies. So I found myself now in high school and junior high, not grateful that I had been adopted into a great family, but focusing on the pit that was my grave, that was death. I got adopted by a Christian home. I knew Jesus. I had given my heart to him. And yet I focused on the negative and the past and the memories. And you know, many people say, they look around and they see people that are drinking they see people that are sleeping around. They see people that are addicted. They see people that are acting out in anger. And they say, oh, that person's an addict. Oh, that person's an alcoholic. Oh, that guy's just a jerk. And we cast judgment on people, but often what you're seeing is just the symptom. It's not actually the root. They're not actually addicts. What they're doing is they're filling a void within them because they're stuck in a pit that is their deathbed, and they can't get out of it, and they don't know how to numb the pain. So they shoot up, or they drink up, or they sleep sleep up with somebody else and somebody else and somebody else, and it's an endless cycle. And some of you here tonight need to hear this. The only solution to get you out of your past is found in Jesus Christ. He'll come, and he'll heal you, and he'll touch you, and he'll make you like brand new. Hallelujah. Friends, I got to tell you, it wasn't until I surrendered my anger and my rage and my questions and I gave up everything of the world and said, God, I will follow you. And he told me he wanted me to be a pastor of all things. <laughs> I was like, God, I'll follow you, anything you want. Like make me a super successful doctor or something. <laughs> God, make me a really rich lawyer or, you know, like an actor. God, I will follow you into that. He said, anything? I said, anything, God. Anything, God. Take my pain away, Father. And I'm thinking he's going to give me like some, make me the president, Lord Jesus. <laughs> you know, and he's like, you're going to be a pastor. I was like, huh, what? A oh, pastor, wait up, no. First of all, no. Second of all, no. Third of all, no, okay, God? You know me. You made me, okay? That's not going to work out good for anybody, okay, God? <laughs> but he said, no, you're going to do it. I said, fine, God. If you'll take away this. I'll give up my dream, and I'll take on yours. And I promise you, God has a dream for every single one of you. If you'll give up yours, you'll take on his. It'll be a better life than you could ever make for yourself. It's the truth. But you got to give it up. Let's quit judging people. Let's quit looking at people. Because you would have seen me, my junior, sophomore year, all oh, that guy, oh, he's just a a weed head, or he's just trying to get at girls, or he's just partying. You didn't, but you look at people and you judge them. You don't even know what's going on with that little kid. If you would have judged me, I would have been like, forget you. You don't know me. It's a symptom of a problem that has roots that are connected to death. Every addict, every 
rageaholic, every person that's bound up. If you'll cut the roots of death, God will plant the tree of life, and they'll dig in deep, and you'll produce good fruit. But you have to cut the roots of death, or else your fruit, it just keeps producing death and death. And why is death all over me? Why is every relationship fail? And why do I go back? Everything in my life just produces death, 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 death. There must be something about your root system that's producing death because it's not the branches and the leaves that produce the fruit, but it's the roots. You're connected to something, guys, and tonight I'm drawing you in. I'm saying let's, let's get away from the old man. Let's like Paul, after he had his little sob fest, he said, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. Not in me, not any good that I've done, lest I should boast, but only in Christ alone. So here's my plea for you tonight, friends. There was a time in my life when a man stood up and gave a call and said, would you lay down your baggage and would you pick up God's dream for your life? And some of you have been running from God's dream for your life. It's time to lay it down. It's time to find true freedom as a servant of God. Yeah. You won't ever find true freedom, freedom until you become a slave. You're never going to do it. Bondage and bondage and bondage. So let's pray. And I have a question to ask you after we pray. Father, I pray for my friends right now. God, I pray that you'd speak to them. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would draw all men unto you not by any eloquence of my words or any skillfulness that I have, but only by you. Your Holy Spirit right now, we ask to come and to draw the hearts of the unbelievers. Draw the hearts of the prodigals. Help them, God. Give them courage to respond now. Now, this is the final thing I want to say to you. Every eye, I want to look at you right now. Look at me right in the eyes. I'm going to go section by section. Are you here tonight and you're not following Christ you haven't stepped into that resurrection power. You're not living a victorious life. And if Christ truly did die for you, you might believe that, but you're not living in victory. I'm asking you tonight to make a choice, to make a change, to give up your old ways and choose God's. This challenge that I'm giving you might sound harsh. It might sound scary. Give up everything to attain him. But what is a vapor of a life for eternity? So I'm asking you tonight, on Easter Sunday, let this be a Sunday, an Easter that you look back on and say, I laid it down, I made a change, I turned from the old ways, and I received Christ in his victory, in his resurrection, and I believe in him fully, and I am stepping into that tonight. So here's the question, and here's the moment that I need you to be bold. Because the Bible does say, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So I always say that salvation needs to be public. I don't see any model in the Bible of salvation being private thing. I, I believe when you get saved, you need to go tell your family, your friends, and I need to, you need to go make it known. It should. The American faith of Christianity, of private faith, is not biblical. Your faith is not private. Nothing about you is private once you become Christian. You belong to Christ. So you, you give up your rights. It's never intended to be a private thing between you and God. No, no, that's such a lie. I've actually heard those type of altar calls. This is between you and the Lord. No, it's not. That's not accurate. Show me one biblical passage that that's true in. It's just not there. It was always public. It was always communal. It was always meant to be lived out in the streets, not just in prayer closets. Always. So I'm asking you right now to be bold. Like Jesus, we're remembering Easter. He went naked, bleeding and beat for you. So this is why I do it. Not to embarrass you, but I just believe in the depths of my heart, if you can't stand before Jesus and claim him in front of a bunch of Christians, there's just no way that you can convince me that you're going to live it out in front of heathens. I'm sorry. It just doesn't make sense because this Christianity thing is hard. You're going to get made fun of. People are going to judge you, all right? But that's the cost of following him. But it's amazing. Like all of that stuff that you're going to deal with, it's like awesome, you get to suffer for Christ, and you get to know that in heaven you have a greater reward. It's like, awesome, you treated me bad for Jesus? That's so cool. Thanks. 
you just gave me a room addition. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm asking you right now. It's not a big deal. I mean, it's not like you should be terrified. Everybody's going to clap for you. But I want you to be bold. And I want you to stand to your feet and say, you know what? I need to receive Jesus in the reality and the victory of the cross. And I'm stepping into my sonship and my daughtership tonight. I'm asking you to just stand up right now. Be bold if that's you. Don't care who's looking. I don't care if you're on my worship team. I don't care if you're a leader here. I don't care if you're the pastor's kid. God bless you. Come on. There's more. Don't be shy. I don't care who you are. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. I know there's more. It's time. It's time to quit fighting with the old sins and the old habits and the old ways. All right. All right. That's amazing. Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay standing. I'm saying, listen, listen, guys. There is a power in this place tonight. Fred, do you feel this? This is incredible. I'm telling you tonight, if you have been bound up in something, I mean, I'm going to say habitual sin and everyone, you're like, I'm not going to stand. People think I'm a weirdo. I already do. Don't worry, okay? It's fine. I'm just kidding. Listen, I don't know what your deal is. Maybe you got like anger or you just like keep getting wrapped up in the same stuff. This is not just an altar call for people that have never known Jesus. I'm saying if you keep going back to the same things, there is freedom tonight. Why wouldn't you want to stand up, okay? Last chance. In five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Come on up. If you're standing, come on. Come on. Come on up. Come on. More. Come with him. Come with your friends right now. Come on. Come on up here. Come on. Come on up. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Don't be shy. This is awesome. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. Everybody stand up now. Come on, stand up. This is awesome, and this is amazing. And by the way, if you had a friend that stood up, and I want you to come up and get next to him right now. If somebody stood up that was your friend, come get next to him right now. Come on, if, if you have a friend up here, come get up here right now. Brothers, sisters, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, come on, I want you to get up here. I want you to stand with them because this is the next part of the exercise. Okay, now listen. If you're up here and no one is standing next to you, just wave at me right now. I'm going to get you. I'm going to, right here, I need somebody. Eric, Bree, anybody else? You don't have somebody standing. Right here, I need a woman. Jamie, Jamie, come on, right here. Who do you need? Labrina or Labrina or Andrea, come on up right now. We need you. Anybody else? I'm going to do something. It's really intentional. Andrea's coming. Right here. We got a young man right here. I want every single person to have somebody with them right now. Here's why. Here's why. Listen. Look at me right now. The Bible says that when you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you are forgiven. It's so simple. That's it. But in James, it says something else. It says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. So you're forgiven, but maybe not healed. You need people in your life. Now, I'm not saying the person that I called up has to be your person, okay? I just wanted to do this as a representation of this. You are stronger together. You need community to do this long term. Look at me right now. I'm your pastor. I need community to do this. I need people that link arms with me when I'm weak. Because sometimes I'm weak and I say, I can't do it anymore. And I feel like I want to fail. And they say, oh, heck no, you're not failing on my watch. This is the biblical model of salvation right here. This, this salvation model that we see a lot of times, close your head, bow your eyes, put your hand up. Nobody even knows who you are. That's like, how are you going to make it? That's like giving birth to a new baby and then just putting them out on the street and like, get a job, loser. <laughs> They're going to die. <laughs> this is what we do to new Christians. So listen to me. If you have made that choice tonight to follow God or you're like, man, I got some stuff and I need to surrender it, you have to get in community. There are a lot of small groups at Upper Room 
And I would say this. Ooh, this is going to be a bold statement. I would rather you go to a small group than even come here. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm not joking. This is a big gathering of a bunch of little groups. That's what Sunday night is. Everybody that I know that's on my worship team, my ushers, my greeters, my parking lot, my media team, every single one of them that I know of that's striving and doing well are all in small groups. You have to be in community because sometimes, I don't care who you are, you're going to fall. You're going to get weak. You need somebody there to say, no, uh no, uh uh I got you. When you're weak, I'm strong. But hey, you know what? Someday I'm going to be weak. I need you to be strong. So I beg you and I plead you. Yes, you've confessed Christ, but now find a community and stick with it, okay? Hey, next week... We're launching a brand new series. It's called Sex, Love, and Marriage. Quotation, does the order matter? Spoiler alert, yes, it does. <laughs> so the Tuesday after that, me and my wife are personally going to be hosting a small group on Tuesday nights specifically designed for married couples or couples that are very close to being married, okay, either engaged or like you're, you're like really like promised to each other and you're committed because we're going to be talking about some heavy stuff, okay? So that's coming up. That's just one of many small groups. Eric has a small group on Thursday nights that's incredible. I love it. I wish I could go more, but I'm a little busy. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day. Wednesday, this Wednesday, everybody look at me. Check it out. This Wednesday, I'm personally teaching a discipleship class up at the main campus in room 202. I invite you to come. If I know you, if I can look in your eyes on a weekly basis, I'm not going to let you fall. I'm going to get your number. I'm going to call you be like, hey, what's going on? You're not falling on my watch. I'm showing up at your house. I'm, I'm texting you. That's how we get through this together, right? You need each other. So with that, I, amen. Caleb, we're going to respond. We're going to have some prayer partners, and it's going to be good. Jamie. Where are you at? Did you want to share the word, or, or how are you feeling about that? Come on up, yeah. Jamie mentioned to me in worship that she felt like God was speaking something. Come on up on stage. Come on. She's so nervous, and that's, that's a big reason why I trust her with the microphone. No, I just, earlier during worship, I just felt like such a day that Jesus represent love, and true love is him giving his life for us. And so a lot of us don't feel love. But he truly loves us. He made a statement, and today is the day that the statement is shown. And I just want you guys, he, all he wants you to do is not you guys loving him, but you have to first receive his love for you. And just, if you have to say it every day, Jesus, you love me. You really love me. And just to get it past here, but to have it here. And sometimes we have to say it over and over again, but... The Lord today just showed a statement that he loves you. No matter what you guys feel today, he loves you. Amen.